uh, mom was someone who was remarkable because um, she was born in Kansas in a not so big city or a maybe not so small village. She used to tell me about time spent in fields looking up at the clouds and how she would dream um, and see shapes in the clouds and daydream, make up stories. She also told me about time spent in trees in Seattle where she would read National Geographic's. They had the full set and she would imagine um, the lives of people far away. More than most people, she was able to bear witness to such a rich array of lives and ways of living. And she traveled extensively. Her work was primarily in Asia, but not exclusively. She also traveled to Africa and South America, and when she was working with Women's World Banking, she worked with uh, USAID, World Bank, Ford Foundation, Bakrakyat, Indonesia, and numerous other organizations, working primarily, ultimately, in cottage industries and microfinance. Her dissertation is about blacksmiths. It's the definitive work about blacksmithing in Indonesia. If if you want to know anything, and it was just published by Duke University, lucky you, but <laughs> not in its full 1,000 page format. <laughs> so you get only 300 pages, I think. But what you begin to see is that this woman was um, not only a rigorous academic, but was courageous and challenging uh, many of the um, experts and much of the thinking of her time. And what she decided was that wet rice cultivation was not necessarily the only way to go. And that what we ought to do, is it getting esoteric? It, it's okay. <laughs> Cottage industries and especially, you know, entre small businesses and entrepreneur real ventures led by women often for their children in order to have greater autonomy, that these did form the backbone of the Indonesian economy, that they were essential and that they were thriving. And um, although she worked with blacksmithing, which was not women necessarily or primarily, um, many of the cottage industries that she, you know, the communities, she, um, was brave then in taking what was handed to her in the way of raw materials and really uh, forging, to use a blacksmithing metaphor um, to the end, her own um, life and path. And um, she was um, someone who died, unfortunately, too young, as many of you know. Uh, it was... Uh, 1995, and she was only 52. But one of the things that was so sad about her passing was that she loved people and places and the things that they created and the stories behind the things that she created so much. She really wasn't willing to, uh, ready to go. I remember that we were in Nepal one year and we passed by a, uh, um, puppet booth, and um, Gigi was, uh, is telling us about her new project that involves puppets. Mom loved puppets. I don't know what it was, but she loved handcrafted puppets, and there was this one that was one of those two-sided ones where you see one side, you flip it over, and the dress falls down, and it's the other side. And uh, she thought this was a really cool puppet. And she said, I have to have it. And I said, no, you don't. Because we don't have any room in our suitcase for said puppet. And um, you have enough puppets at home. And you have no home in which to place these puppets. And you're a drifter. And why don't you just settle down and be content with the handful of uh, garnets you got along the river? And... and, um, and <laughs> So I went hiking, and when I came home, guess what was there in her suitcase? She was trying to smuggle it through without telling me. 
it was the puppet. And uh, that puppet ended up, it was so important to her because it was crafted lovingly by someone and by hand because there was a story behind it and because she felt like this puppet along with the others, you know, would allow us to have these delightful puppet shows. This puppet is one of the many things that I found in a box along with my childhood books when I was pregnant with my daughter, Suhela, who is now six. And on the top of one of the boxes was written for Maya's children. And I was pregnant and I wept. I can say that now I wept without actually doing the weeping, which is a big, you know, that's a good thing. And when I opened them up, I was struck by how these artifacts were so vital because they, um, because they allowed me to begin to tell her story and that what was of value was not so much the material good, but the memory that they inspired and, and the, the connection that could begin to happen. So that's one of the things that is so valuable to me about this children's book is this idea of forging that connection and bringing people who have passed on together with those who would benefit so much from their unwavering love. And one of the things that I wanted to share about my mother was the fact that she was so good at dissolving boundaries. I've mentioned it in term in you know in her village work and when I think of what we must do in terms of understanding a woman's economy and understanding how to move forward, I think of the uh, dissolving of boundaries as the most important thing. It's a very hard thing to do in education, really, because so much of the schooling to which we subject our children these days is about competition. It's about, um, you know, who's doing better or best and and it's about winning and losing and and you know right and wrong and good and bad and black and white i know that history is still too often taught from one single perspective as um, as though that could ever be meaningful in terms of understanding the truth one of the things that um, i really work to do and that i'm trying to promote this week is this notion that we can through the internet today begin to share these stories and to reveal a history that is truly multifaceted. And these women are doing precisely that. One of the things I have my students do is I have them go and look at English language newspapers from all over the world. Every country has one and you now can see them all online. And when you look at the different placement of uh, the, the stories and the different ways in which these stories are told and crafted and what is prioritized or what is minimized, you begin to see the bigger picture and you see what we need to do in order to have a richer understanding and one that is more useful. And I certainly have my students, we, we do exercises in empathy. A bridge is crafted from wall to wall and I create these index cards and the students write journals and letters and, and poems from the perspective of people in history who um, have been in the margins, who, who, who have been in the shadows, and, and who are not present in the textbooks in any meaningful way. And they put these letters, and after doing extensive research, mind you, and they put them up on the wall, and at the end of the semester, we have this wonderful bridge that connects past and present, connects the world of the classroom to the world outside, and the world, um, um, of uh, our nation to many other nations. And so I would love for us to find, whatever you do, a way to translate this extraordinary experience where these boundaries have been dissolved by you and all of the partners and participants and bring that expectation and make it the norm. Um, and um, I do, for instance, um, structured academic controversies instead of debates, right? So what you do is you argue one position and then uh, in the next breath you have to argue the exact opposite position and you do so, it's like 
elbows believing game or doubting game. You believe everything about um, you know, one side. You uphold it, you expound it, you, you, you fight for one position, then you do the doubting game, which is that you argue against it. You try to tear it apart um, lovingly through critical thinking. And, and then you do the sharing game. How do we mediate between these um, perspectives? So basic things like that, but just sort of refusing division, I think, is um, really important. You saw here the tsunami, and for me, um, you know, recently in Hawaii, in the tsunami in Japan has really um, affected us in so many ways. Um, of course, a sense of kinship, you know, we are gravely impacted in our minds and in our spirits, but also in our economies. And you begin to see that, um, that these things are uh, not divisible, right? That, that uh, that um, everything truly is interconnected and uh, in a very real way. And when working for the East-West Center as an education specialist, I was able to go to Japan, specifically Okinawa, and they have this peace monument. Have you folks ever seen it in Okinawa? It's very cool. Go check it out. So it's right at the ocean, and you see these, just like the Vietnam Memorial, these uh, black uh, walls with names inscribed. And, um, but what makes it so special, I think, is that row after row of names, it's not just the Japanese names or the Okinawan names um, that are there, it's the American names too and the European and basically everyone who was lost has their name inscribed there. They are owned, they are together, and they are together, their names, um, because they were together involved in the war, even if they were on opposing sides. Uh, they all lost, as did their families. And it's on the ocean, and it just sort of drops off. And you see this, um, you know, this spiral, just like in the book, and just like in the carpet and the president's house, I noticed. But, you know, <laughs> spirals, which are, of course, very feminine and, and you know, yoni and lingam, you know, I'm a good anthropologist daughter. But you see then around this circle and spiral, you see, you know, you basically see it drop off into the ocean. And these were the cliffs where many Okinawans um, ended up jumping rather than being captured, rather than being subjected to the horrors of, uh, of this war, of the battle. And, uh, and what they say is that the ocean is present there and the monument is here so that we can send the ripples of peace across the oceans and, and they can touch every country. And I'm reminded of that as the you know, horrors in Japan unfold. You know, those ripples, you know, they, um, um, they are terrible now but um, they perhaps can remind us of the possibilities of, uh, of peace and through dialogue and the dissolving of boundaries.